Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is going to be on estrogen dominance and poor detoxification. We're going to go over the big factors of what drives that. I actually have a patient lab here. We'll go over and we'll review it live and just kind of give you my thinking on what's happening at the physiological level. And we'll try to get to the root cause overall. That's really our big goal. And before we do, please smash that like button. It really helps the search algorithm. Put your comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on estrogen dominance and things that you have done personally to help your situation. All right, so let's dive in. What is estrogen dominance? We have two major phases in a woman's cycle. We have the follicular phase, right, or the proliferative phase. This is where the follicle and the egg grows. And so the major fertilizer for that is estrogen. So first half of the cycle, estrogen goes up. That causes the egg to grow. Next, we have progesterone, the second half of the cycle. This is the luteal phase. This is primarily the part of the cycle where we're actually getting a test done so we can look at your progesterone levels right in the heart of the luteal phase. So follicular phase, estrogen, right, peaks out around day 10, 11. Progesterone rises up right here. This is where ovulation happens. And then we have the luteal phase, the last half of the cycle, and we're testing progesterone right here, right in the middle of that on a 26 to 30 day cycle, right around day 19 to 22 ish. Okay. Now the typical ratio of estrogen to progesterone, right around 23, 24 to one progesterone to estrogen. That's a pretty good ratio on average throughout the whole month. That's a pretty good one. Again, we need this good ratio estrogen to help thicken up that estrogen lining that uterine lining in the first half of the cycle, estrogen helps things uh, grow. Progesterone helps things grow up. So progesterone helps things mature, and it essentially acts like almost like sticky glue. So when that egg implants into that uterine lining, it stays and can mature. Very important. So when we look at estrogen dominance, a whole bunch of symptoms can happen. Mood issues, uh, breast tenderness, cramping, back pain. We can see things like uterine fibroid growth. We can see things like fibrocystic breast tissue issues. Um, obviously, irritability, mood stuff, uh, hair issues. Obviously, as we get closer into menopause, we may even see hot flash issues depending on if estrogen goes low or high. You can still have estrogen dominance and still have low estrogen. You could have estrogen really low, but progesterone is a little bit lower in relationship, and you could still be in that estrogen dominance category. And the big factors that drive that, right? We always want to look at diet and lifestyle. Are we eating a bunch of hormones in our food, a bunch of pesticides in our food? Are we eating out of a bunch of plastics? Are we rubbing a bunch of um, bad skincare lines that have synthetic hormones in there, parabens, right? Those kind of things. You can use the environmentalworkinggroup.com to look at, um, I think it's a skin deep cosmetic database to look at chemicals in your skincare. That's really important to look at. And make sure you're organic. Make sure pesticide free, hormone free, especially in the meats. That's a good starting point. And then after that, we, we want to use functional medicine to really help support detoxification and hormone balance after that. All right, let's go dive in here. Show you a real patient's lab. Okay, so let's dive in. So out of the gate here, we have our three major hormones up top, right? So out of the gates, you can see this person has a high level of estradiol. That's a big one. So 3.58. And you could see progesterone. We want these somewhat in tandem, right? At least progesterone may be a little bit higher than estrogen. So when I start seeing progesterone low, imagine estrogen, imagine progesterone around what, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock on, on an actual clock face. And then estrogen's around what, 2, 2.30? Right, so we should have progesterone and estrogen at or around the same time, right? Time of the day. So in this analogy, that'd be like 3.58 versus like 17 progesterone. So you can see there's not good parity here. That automatically tells us that we are in an estrogen dominant state. Now this patient, right, she's a early 50s, she's still cycling. We'd want probably mid to bottom third for estrogen and probably mid-ish for progesterone. That'd be pretty good for a woman of that age perimenopausal-ish, and you can see her estrogen's really high, and her progesterone's very low. So classic estrogen-dominant hormone rhythm, hormone pattern. You can see on the adrenal side, low cortisol waking in the last half of the day. Free cortisol's bottom 25% of the range. Her total, total's not even on this graph here, but total is very low. It's absolutely in the tank. And so when you have chronic low cortisol like that, there tends to be a lot of catabolic stress that's gone on, usually for decades up until this point, and that's why this woman's also having connective tissue issue, cellulite, probably because a lot of catabolic stress has really beaten down that connective tissue. And this person's also having hot flashes too. Even though her estrogen is really high, her progesterone is really low. And it's possible her estrogen may be even too high. And this whole estrogen dominant ratio is throwing it off as well. 
It's very possible. Now, out of the gates, too, you're also going to see very, very low DHEA. That's out of the, off the charts low, right? I mean, that's like greater than 60 is 20 to 150, and she's at less than 20, right? At 15, and so that'd be like an 80 or 90 year old. So she's, her estrogen or her DHEA is incredibly low. And that's part of the reason why she has all these symptoms because as your, as your ovarian reserve depletes as you go into menopause, right? Once your follicles run out, you don't have the ability to have that cycle anymore. You start, that's considered menopause. Once it's been one year without a cycle, you're menopausal. And so you're gonna be relying more on DHEA reserves from your adrenals. So if we don't have adequate levels of DHEA, that's gonna make it really hard for you when you go into menopause to be able to modulate your hormones. Normally you have that uh, follicle reserve, now you have to rely on DHA. So this person's DHEA is really depleted. So anytime I'm dealing with women that are going into perimenopause, menopause, we have to support the adrenals and get the adrenal reserve up. So we have to get the cortisol rhythm better. We have to work on supporting DHEA, supporting all the stressors that beat down the adrenals over time. It's not just food. It could be any emotional stress. Maybe make sure we're not over-exercising. Make sure sleep's good. Make sure all the... Make sure there's no unresolved emotional stress. If there's stress, everyone's got it, but make sure there's at least a plan to work on it and address it, right? That's everyone. We just don't want to be putting our emotional stress, um, you know, making it unprocessed and sweeping it under the rug, so to speak. And then we want to make sure our diet's solid, we're managing our blood sugar, we're sleeping good, and our exercise is dialed in for what we can handle. Okay, and then we um, look at the estrogen levels. So we have the different kinds of estrogens. As a cycling female, estradiol is gonna be what's predominant. As you shift into menopause, estriol will be the predominant hormone there, okay? And so you can see this person's estradiol, 3.58. We already saw that on page uh, two, but their estriol is mid-range, which that's probably okay. I mean, she's moving in that direction. These, these levels are actually on the higher side even for a healthy cycling female. So the fact that she's perimenopausal and they're high, it's like, whoa, okay. And then we, so we really gotta get that one. We gotta look at getting progesterone up a little bit closer, like two, two, three o'clock, right? Based on the, the lab reference range, right? Two, three o'clock, right? This is, this is progesterone right here. So we want it somewhere right around two, three o'clock there. And then you can look at their estrogens here. We have E1, E2, and E3. And you can see how these different things metabolize downstream. So you can see, E1 can go to 16 hydroxy. It can also go to 4 hydroxy, and it also can go to 2 hydroxy down here. So 16, 4, and 2. And then estradiol and estriol can move in this direction as well and all filter downstream. So you could see um, 16 estrogen, right? And then 4 is really important. If we don't metabolize that, that can be very reactive and create a lot of oxidative damage and stress. Glutathione is very important for helping to modulate estrogen detoxification, as well as, as you can see going here, to hydroxy, um, we need good methylation. And so this methylation gauge in the bottom left, the 2-methoxy, two 2-hydroxy two estrogen is very low. So that tells me methylation's poor. So methylation is nothing more than a carbon and three hydrogens binding to whatever that hormone is to help methylate it and help detoxify it. Now, um, we need for methylation, choline, we need folate, we need B12, we need B6, very important. You get a lot of this from good green vegetables, good high-quality meat. If we see these issues are on the lower side, poor detoxification, we're gonna add some of these B vitamins and we may add in extra sulfur, like glutathione or NAC. We may add in some binders to help lower estrogen, like things like calcium to glucurate, really good binder, also a good binder from mold. We may add in citrus pectin, activated charcoal. We may add in extra sulfur compounds from vegetables like DIM or indol 3 methane, or indol 3 carbonyl or DIM, diendol methane or indol 3 carbonyl. They're sulfur that help bind up and really help phase two estrogen detoxification. So that's really important to, to bring the estrogens down, bring the progesterone up with some hormonal support maybe a little bioidentical estrogen. We may use herbs to help modulate LH signaling in the brain. We may do some estrogen modulator herbs as well that kind of help bring estrogen back down uh, or at least bring the tone of the receptor site back down a little bit. We're gonna help detoxify estrogen. We're gonna help run the methylation and activation pathways better and maybe give extra sulfur as well. Now, if we go look here, they actually ran some organic acids on this test, which is pretty cool. So this person's melatonin is on the lower side, so sleep may not be as restorative, or there may be some sleep issues. So out of the gate, you can see um, adrenaline, right? Vanillomandolate it's very low, so there's definitely some adrenaline issues. Um, Homovanillate's high, so there's definitely some dopamine and adrenaline issues. So neurotransmitters are definitely a problem. And again, 
Adrenaline's a, dopamine's a precursor to adrenaline. So when you have a dopamine problem, a lot of times you'll have an adrenaline problem. And then you can see this person's glutathione, pyroglutamate's also low, right? And that could easily plug into the low estrogen, right? Because we saw how important estrogen metabolism was with glutathione, right? See how estrogen, glutathione is really important to help lower that high level of 4-hydroxy. So I hope that helps and um, makes sense there. Let's see, anything else I wanted to hit here? So we just talked about the adrenals, really have to work on supporting good cortisol rhythm regarding the hormones, bring the progesterone up, use herbs to modulate estrogen and progesterone, make sure we dial in good estrogen detoxification with the different things that I mentioned. Uh, and that's kind of a good starting point. So hope that makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into good estrogen metabolism. Uh, one thing I'm going to highlight here out of the gates is actually, make this big again, good gut function, right? If we have poor gut function and bad bacteria, that can cause imbalances in beta-glucuronidase, which is an enzyme that's also very helpful, which it also impedes detoxification. So beta-glucuronidase kind of releases estrogen in its conjugated state. Imagine like we put handcuffs on the estrogen, we help escort it out of the body, beta glucuronidase breaks those handcuffs off the estrogen and allows it to kind of go back in circulation. So beta glucuronidase, which is a bad bacterial enzyme, can easily impact estrogen dominance. So good gut health is also a missing link to good hormonal detoxification. And that can be part of the whole problem. So it can be food quality, it can be water, it can be toxins in the in skincare, it can be dysglycemia, it can be the adrenals. All those things play a major, major role. So again, this is Dr. J here. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Put your comments below. Let me know what you like best. And also, if you need hormonal support and you want to dive in and you're needing someone to kind of work with, I'm available worldwide if you need help. I'll put a link down below if you want to reach out to myself and or my colleagues. We are here to help you. And if you enjoyed it, let me know what you like best. All right, guys, link below. Let me dive in and help you guys with some questions. Okay, excellent. No problem. Thanks, Mike. Yes, you got it. I'm glad I did it a, a second time. I had a, a cat screaming at me the whole time. That's why I had to move in the middle of the last video to go uh, be, make him quiet, quiet up. Uh, Jay, how do you lower estrogen in men and women and raise testosterone in men naturally? Well, how do we lower estrogen in men? Same thing with all the food, right? is decrease all the estrogen exposure through plastics, foods, pesticides, chemicals. Uh, go watch the documentary on PBS, The Disappearing Male. Just talks about all the estrogens in the environment. So first, decrease all the estrogen exposure. Good hydration, good water, the solution to pollution is dilution. Eat high quality animal protein. Keep your carbs down. The biggest thing that's gonna cause men that, to become high in estrogen is the enzyme aromatase, which will go up with high levels of insulin. Keep your carbs in check. The only way you should be doing more carbs is if you're really active. Really active, you're doing a lot of activity, a lot of steps, a lot of movement, a lot of running, marathon stuff, a lot of CrossFit, um, and or you're getting like 20,000 steps a day, or you're like an ectomorph, right? Imagine kind of the basketball player, right? They can just naturally burn carbs like crazy. And then also there's different herbs, right? Selenium, zinc, like nutritionally, getting enough protein, lifting, good weight, stimulus is very important for growth hormone and testosterone. And there's different herbs that you can do, right? Tonkat Ali, Tribulus, very helpful. I'm trying to think what else. Um, horny goat weed's excellent. I said Tribulus already. Maca's excellent. Ashwagandha, dopamine precursors like Macuna purines and tyrosine are good. Dr. J, how do we start detoxification in order to get healthy? Well, the first thing is drink a lot of water. Half your body weight in ounces. Solution to pollution is dilution. And then eat organic and make sure you're breaking down your protein and your vegetables because that's going to be where most of those nutrients come from. So work on that first. And then if you want, like we may use phase one and phase two nutrients. Like in my line, we have a product called Antioxidant Supreme which is phase one detoxification nutrients or detox aminos, which is phase two. It's glutathione, it's all the sulfur aminos, it's calcium to glucurate, right? It's all those things to help that. We may add in some additional binders as well. So that's kind of how we, we work on that out of the gate is we may use nutrients, but it all starts on a foundation of diet and lifestyle and then we go up from there. 
Dr. J, how do I get off antidepressants and get to the root cause of my health? Well, first off is how long you've been on it. The longer you've been on it, the slower you have to taper off. So I don't ever recommend moving um, medications like antidepressants, benzos, until we're really stable with diets, inflammations down, nutrient densities down, and then we reach out to the prescriber and say, hey, you know, I want to get off these things as responsibly as possible, and then we just do a gentle, slow taper. If someone's been on it a long time, it may take a month or a year. If they've been on it a relatively short time, then you can probably get off it a lot faster, but I always want the prescriber involved, and we typically work on getting the foundation dialed in and then slowly back off that with the prescriber involved. I'm from Canada. Would it be possible if I can get a consultation with you personally? Yes, justinhealth.com. Click with the work with Dr. J button right there. There's also a link right below the video. Look for that link and you can schedule that there too. Oh, by the way, birth control pills automatically show you an estrogen dominance. That's ethanol estradiol automatically there. That may not even show up in the test. So stay away from birth control pills. If you need a contraceptive method, you know, look at just old fashioned condom, diaphragm, or a Paragard copper IUD may be okay if you want a set it and forget it method. Um, again, there's copper there, so the copper is a little bit of an issue, but I look at the hormones being a bigger issue. And the Marina IUD does put synthetic norestrogel, which is progesterone in there. So copper IUD may be better if you can tolerate it. Some women can't. How do you elevate progesterone? Um, we may use certain herbs like um, white peony, chase tree. We may use things like maca. We may use bioidentical progesterone, uh, even some pregnenolone. All that can be helpful. Herbal protocol, and again, it depends on each person. Herbal protocol for Lyme disease. Cowden protocol on top of proper diets such as gaps and getting off antibiotics. Yeah, so... The Cowden protocol is good. There's some, the Beyond Balance has some decent protocols. Um, Byron White has some good protocols. I use kind of a blend of those um, protocols to really help, like Cryptolopus, Sita, Sita Acuta, um, Cat's Claw, or Cemento, all wonderful herbal. I've used a bunch of those, Astragalus, Rishi, all very helpful for modulating the immune system and also helping with Lyme. And of course, you have your, your general antibiotic doxycycline protocol, which may be okay if you are acute, right? If you had an acute Lyme infection, but if not, I tend to always want to go with the herbals. And most people, I always want to deal with the gut and the hormones first because people that have Lyme issues have every symptom in the book. And Lyme is too overdiagnosed because it just is one of those catch-all diagnoses, that and mold. So I always work on the foundation because that makes the immune system stronger. And then usually so much of the other symptoms kind of take care of themselves on their own, and then when it's time to do killing, there's a stronger constitution, stronger immune system present, so we can come at that harder with some of the herbals and um, get better results, not have all the Herxheimer issues that so many Lyme's patients um, know so dearly. They just suffer from a lot of the Herxing. And a lot of doctors, they kill too fast, too hard, and they use the Herxing as justification of, yeah, we're doing it, we're doing it. It's like, well, no, I mean, I wanna back off, I wanna build a strong immune system and then come at it, and if we Herx, we, we pull back off of that. So hope that helps, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, let me know down below. Again, if you need help on the hormone side, I am your person. Click down below. You'll see a link. If you want to reach out and you like the content, feel free and reach out. Again, this is Dr. J here signing off. You guys have a phenomenal weekend. Take care, y'all.